These are the times that try men's souls. The crowd called to them. Lobsters, bloody backs. We're not afraid of you. I turned to look towards the officer, and I heard the word fire. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. We are a race of beings who have long labored under the abuse of the world. Revolution is a frightening word. It brings up bloody images of power taken by force, of a world turned upside down. What would bring people to the point of risking everything to try something new? In 1760, the colonists celebrated the arrival of King George III to the throne of England. Like all loyal British subjects, they believed that they lived under the fairest and most balanced system of government ever made by man. Only 16 years later, these same colonists were locked in a deadly struggle with the most powerful military force in the world. What happened in those 16 years? What drove the colonists to the point of revolution? According to John Adams, the American Revolution began long before the War for Independence actually started. The real American Revolution was in the minds of the people and occurred before a drop of blood was shed. So when did it begin? Victory over France in the Seven Years' War left England in charge of an enormous, sprawling empire. Great Britain had a huge debt as a consequence of that Seven Years' War. Uh, so the British Parliament had a real need to find a way to raise additional revenues to pay for the cost of this exciting new territory in North America. So Parliament passed the Sugar and Currency Acts in 1764, but without the colonists' consent. If a government can tax you, then that government can take away your property, your wealth. So any government that overstepped its boundaries in terms of taxation was attacking your fundamental right to hold property. Did Parliament have the right to pass laws to which the colonies had not consented? When Parliament passed the Stamp Act of 1765, the colonists responded with a resounding no. The stamp tax was a wide-ranging uh, tax on all manner of economic life in America. No taxation without representation blared newspapers up and down the colonies. A Stamp Act Congress met in New York and sent respectful protests to the king. The British called this a dangerous tendency. But an even more dangerous tendency was stirring up in Boston. On the night of August 14th, a furious mob tore through the house of Stamp Master Andrew Oliver. During the next 12 days, Stamp Act riots took over Boston. Several thousand uh, Bostonians, common people, marching down the streets in full cry and heading for the stamp distributor's house. And you would have seen that house come flying apart, brick by brick, timber by timber. The pictures would have been torn off the wall. Feather pillows would have been ripped open. And of course, the lieutenant governor and the stamp distributor were fleeing for their lives with their family in their nightshirts. Resistance to the Stamp Act spread throughout the colonies as newspapers told the stories of ordinary people standing up for their rights. Led by groups called the Sons of Liberty, protesters terrified British officials into resigning their jobs. This was not only effective uh, as a means of stopping the implementation of the Stamp Act, but it gave to the lower classes, perhaps for the first time in American history, a sense of their own power, a sense of their own ability to affect their destinies. Attacking wealthy officials was not only a way of fighting British rule, but also allowed the poor to express their resentment of the wealthy men of the colonies. Since the poor had no voice in any government, what did it matter to them if England or Massachusetts took their money? They demanded that their interests be heard. Parliament hadn't expected such angry resistance. In March of 1766, it repealed the Stamp Act. All over America, colonists went wild with joy, clanging bells and lighting bonfires. 
Colonial mob activities like the Stamp Act riots taught people who had never been involved in politics the power of group action in resisting authority. The Americans had won a partial victory, but Parliament was determined to make the colonies obey its laws. The Townsend Acts of 1767 put a tax on tea, cloth, and other manufactured goods imported from England. Once again, Americans fought back. The, the primary means by which the colonists uh, protested against the Townsend duties uh, was a thoroughgoing boycott on all goods imported from England into America. That was a very effective boycott. The British lost much more money in trade than they gained in revenue from the Townsend duties. I will tell you what I have done. I have not had tea since last Christmas, nor bought a new cap or gown. All my sister Americans are as with one heart determined to be free. What we fight for is this plain truth, that no man has a right to take our money without our consent. The Townsend Acts also reawoke the fury of the people of Boston. This time, the royal governor turned to England for help. British soldiers marched into Boston in 1768. Soon, angry fights were breaking out. On March 5th, 1770, things took a deadly turn. <laughs> Captain Preston swore under oath that he never told the soldiers to fire. But when the smoke cleared, five colonists were dead. The first to die was a half Wampanoag, half black dock worker named Crispus Attucks. Was it a massacre? Paul Revere said it was. His engraving showed British soldiers lined up like a firing squad, shooting into a group of innocent townspeople. Paul Revere's engraving spread like wildfire through the colonies, enraging colonists against the British. It was easier to build rebellion among the artisans and shopkeepers of Boston than among the wealthy. Not all of the members of the upper classes were completely comfortable with the opposition to Br British policy. For example, uh, in the aftermath of the Boston Massacre, a good many of the wealthy citizens of New York and Philadelphia thought that the lower class mobs in Boston had it coming to them. But Parliament wasn't pleasing Virginia planters like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson any more than Boston's artisans. Colonial America's political leaders were deeply influenced by a group of English politicians known as the Whigs, who believed that when too much power was given to one person or group, then power became corrupt. When Parliament started writing laws for the colonies, many colonists began to believe that a power-hungry conspiracy was trying to take away their rights as Englishmen. If this was true, then the colonists must resist corruption for the sake of liberty everywhere. Parliament repealed most of the Townsend duties in 1770, but three years later, it passed a Tea Act the Tea Act of 1773 would have saved the colonists money. But the issue now was who would rule in colonial America. Rally, Mohawks. Bring your axes and tell King George we'll pay no taxes on his foreign tea. Disguised as Native Americans, the Sons of Liberty boarded three British ships and dumped their tea into the Boston Harbor. This was not the work of an angry mob but a carefully planned rebellion against British authority. Furious at this show of vandalism, Parliament passed the Coercive Acts. When the British tried to punish the Port of Boston in 1774 by the passage of the Coercive Acts, Acts which closed the Port of Boston, among other things, they hoped that other colonies would actually desert Boston and run to pick up the trade that Boston would lose uh, by the passage of that act. Uh, the British proved to be wrong. As much as the American colonies may have been uneasy about the radicalism of Boston, they saw that a threat to Boston's liberty was also a threat to their own. The cause of Boston is the cause of America, wrote George Washington. 
In September 1774, leading political figures from the different colonies met in Philadelphia for a first Continental Congress. The Bostonians suspected that the British might try to take war supplies they had hidden at Concord. They set up an alarm system using lanterns in the Old North Church. On the night of April 18, 1775, three Patriot riders, Sybil Luddington, William Dawes, and the most prominent among them, Paul Revere, galloped through the countryside, alerting the sleeping Minutemen. Stand your ground, John Parker shouted as the British soldiers streamed over the hill into Lexington. Don't fire unless fired upon, but if they want to have a war, let it begin here. Now Parker stood with some 70 men as 700 British soldiers came surging into Lexington like a red river. Parker must have realized that it was hopeless because he told his men to walk away. But someone fired a shot and the British responded with several volleys. When the smoke cleared, eight Americans were dead. Word spread immediately, and some 4,000 local militiamen picked up their muskets, looking for revenge. By the time the British got back to Boston, 272 had been shot. The war for independence had begun. Even after military conflict broke out, even after the battles of Lexington and Concord, most of America's leaders hoped that they could achieve some sort of reconciliation with Great Britain. Believing that the conspiracy to control America was based in Parliament, the Second Continental Congress sent a petition to King George, humbly begging him to address their wrongs. George III's response was emphatic and hostile. Uh, he declared the colonies in a state of rebellion. He sent several thousand troops to America to put down the rebellion. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. A situation like the present has not happened since the days of Noah and the Ark. The birthday of a new world is at hand. Thomas Paine, a former staymaker and minor English customs official, had been in the colonies for just over a year when in January of 1776 he published a small pamphlet calling for independence called Common Sense. Common Sense is a brilliant piece of political writing when he really argues that these are momentous things we're trying to do. We're standing up for liberty. We're standing up for a new way of being human on the planet um, that hasn't been tried before. It was a firecracker. It was unlike anything the colonists had read. It was written for the man in the streets, the man um, on the docks, the farmer in his field. Plain, down-to-earth language. And he made the American cause sound like common sense. With Americans clamoring for independence and the King of England insistent on submission and obedience, Congress acted. On July 4, 1776, the delegates formally approved independence, more than a year after the war had begun. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve... The Declaration of Independence explained to Americans and the world why the separation from England was necessary. Although addressed to the King of England, it spoke to people everywhere. Its words have been passed down through the centuries and given hope to people all over the world. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Declaration of Independence was written by Virginia planter Thomas Jefferson, who combined old ideas from English common law and the latest European political theory to create justification for independence. Jefferson and the other founding fathers lived during the Enlightenment, or Age of Reason, 
a period in which philosophers believed that God had created all people with the capacity for reason, to use their minds to unlock the secrets of nature and to better their lives. Some Enlightenment thinkers, like John Locke and Montesquieu, believed that reason could be used to understand government. They thought that if all men were created equal, then government existed only to protect the people's rights. When government did not, then the people had the right to end that government and start a new one. But the truly radical thing about the American Revolution was that the Americans took those ideas and put them into practice. They insisted in creating their own governments that those governments be founded upon the consent of the people. That is the very essence of the idea of popular sovereignty. Jefferson also listed all of the legal rights of Englishmen that the king had denied to the colonists. He did this to show the world that the colonies had turned to revolution only as a last resort. The Declaration of Independence asserted that all men are created equal. That made men like patriot John Dickinson shiver. Shall we renounce the liberties we have to go and seek it in I know not what form of republic? Had resistance to British authority gone too far? Many of the wealthy and powerful in America only wanted to preserve what they already had. But now people were talking democracy. Democracy was a dirty word to the upper ranks of society. The Stamp Act riots in Boston had shown wealthy Americans what the lawless mob could do. Many colonists, known as loyalists, stayed true to the crown. They were disturbed by radical new ideas about equality and human rights that threatened to disrupt their world. Among the radical new notions unleashed by the American Revolution was the idea that women and enslaved Africans were also entitled to political rights. In the new code of law, I desire that you would remember the ladies. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to have a rebellion of our own. Abigail Adams, 1776. Women's roles in the revolution were, were many. Some were nurses, um, some were sewing uniforms, others were raising money, but even a larger number were just taking care of business at home because when the man was away fighting in the war, someone had to keep the farm going. The most famous words in the Declaration of Independence, perhaps the most famous words ever written, are those words, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yet how could the Americans who believe those words at the same time hold slaves? Many Americans began slowly following independence to see uh, the contradiction between a belief in equality on the one hand and the practice of slavery on the other. The petition of a great number of blacks of this province who by divine permission are held in a state of slavery within the bowels of a free and Christian country, humbly showing that your petitioners apprehend we have in common with all other men a natural right to our freedoms without being deprived of them by our fellow men as we are a free-born people and have never forfeited this blessing by any compact or agreement whatever. The American Revolution also raised questions about the rights of African Americans. If all men are created equal, then why did one-fifth of the American population live in slavery? The British were quick to take advantage of this inconsistency between American ideals and practice. The British invited African-American slaves who enlisted in the British Army to do so in exchange for freedom. Um, in particular, Lord Dunmore, who was governor of Virginia, invited the slaves and provoked mass outrage among slaveholders. Um, but got himself a number of, of African-American soldiers. Black Americans fought on the Patriot side, sometimes substituting for their master in the militia, but a much larger number fought with the British because it was the British, not the Americans, who largely were offering freedom. Declaring independence from England was a bold and very dangerous action. 
General George Washington was smart enough to know that he did not have enough men and enough uh, firepower to defeat what was probably the world's most powerful army, the army of the Empire of Great Britain. Uh, but he also knew that he had one very important advantage. He was fighting on his own turf. A and the British Army had to depend upon a 3,000-mile supply line stretching all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. America would also need strong allies. On the day the Declaration of Independence was signed, Benjamin Franklin, perhaps the most world-renowned of all Americans, set sail for France. France had been an enemy of Great Britain's for many centuries. But in fact, France was looking out after itself. It was only be willing to, to fight on the side of the Americans if they could be convinced that the Americans could win the war. The fate of America rested with George Washington and his makeshift Continental Army. Having faced stiff military and popular resistance in New England, the British commander, Sir William Howe, decided to send his troops to New York City and cut New England off from the other rebels. Washington was determined to keep the British out of New York. Howe's army of British regulars and German mercenaries called Hessians soundly defeated the small, untrained Continental Army, first at Brooklyn Heights on Long Island, and then in Manhattan itself. These defeats taught Washington a valuable lesson. One of the solutions that they came up with was that with an understaffed army that's small and inexperienced, which the American army was, Indian war styles, native war styles of hiding behind rocks and walls, jumping out from behind trees, ambushing, sniping, all kinds of guerrilla tactics, really, that the colonists had learned from the Indians during the previous wars, because the British still marched, you know, abreast, you know, 12 abreast in bright red coats through the woods, were very visible, very enticing targets uh, if you were crouching behind a rock. The middle years of the War for Independence became a deadly game of cat and mouse as Washington's tactics made the war long and expensive for the debt-ridden British. The British Army pushed into New Jersey, occupying towns and punishing civilians as they advanced. Washington's retreating army was beginning to despair. Crossing the Delaware River on Christmas night, 1776, Washington used almost every man in his ragtag army to attack the British camp at Trenton, capturing more than 900 Hessians. He then struck at Princeton, forcing the British to withdraw from central New Jersey. The victory sent American spirits temporarily soaring, but Washington remained outnumbered and outsupplied. The cold winter of 1777 at Valley Forge was the Army's lowest point. The war was at a standstill, and the troops were miserable. I am sick and out of humor. Poor food, hard lodging, cold weather, fatigue, nasty clothes, vomit half my time, smoked out of my senses. The devil's in it. I can't endure it. Why are we sent here to starve and freeze? While the British enjoyed themselves in Philadelphia, Washington's troops huddled in crude log huts. They had little food or clothing. Some went barefoot. By spring, more than 3,000 men died of starvation or disease. So who were the men who fought for independence? In the beginning of the war, men from all walks of life volunteered to fight for America's independence. Close to half of them were teenagers. But as the war dragged on, the better off began to hire the poor to fight the war. Some men used their slaves and indentured servants as substitutes, promising them their freedom if they managed to come out alive. Promises of bonus pay and land out west attracted many. In the fall of 1777, the Americans had scored a major victory as General Gates defeated Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne and captured his entire army at Saratoga, New York. Convinced Americans could win the war, France formally recognized American independence in December 1711. 
A few months later, France entered the war on the American side. The tide was turning. After Burgoyne's defeat at Saratoga, the British moved the war to the south, where they heard thousands were still loyal to the king. Pacify the south quickly, they reasoned, and the north would fall soon after. At first, it seemed that they were right. Sir Henry Clinton easily overran Savannah, Georgia in December of 1778. Two years later, he captured Charleston, South Carolina, and the entire Southern Continental Army of more than 5,000 soldiers. In August 1780, Lord Cornwallis soundly defeated Horatio Gates' recently reorganized Southern Army at Camden, South Carolina. When Washington chose General Nathaniel Greene to lead those soldiers that remained, the Southern Army consisted of only 700 poorly supplied survivors. Already, the tide had begun to turn back in favor of the British. Greene negotiated treaties with the Cherokees and Creeks, treated loyalists charitably, and reorganized his troops. In January 1781, Daniel Morgan beat Colonel Banastra Tarleton's legion at Cowpens. That March, Greene's army inflicted heavy damage on Cornwallis's troops at Guilford Courthouse and forced the British to withdraw to the coast. Deciding that he must first conquer Virginia in order to hold the South, Cornwallis moved his troops to Yorktown on a small peninsula between the James and York rivers. Washington quickly moved his troops south from New York. When a French fleet under the Comte de Grasse moved into the Chesapeake and turned back a British fleet sent to rescue Cornwallis, the British were cut off from the sea and trapped by 17,000 advancing American and French troops. On October 17, 1781, Cornwallis surrendered. When the British troops marched out to give up their weapons, their army band played a song called The World Turned Upside Down. Yankee Doodle had won his independence. In the Treaty of Paris, signed in 1783, England recognized the United States of America as an independent country. The war for independence brought many changes to Americans. The nation had gained independence and undertaken an unprecedented experiment in democratic government. Tens of thousands of slaves and loyalists would leave America forever. The war also had a profound impact on Native Americans. When the war broke out, the Eastern Woodland Native American nations were tired of American aggression against their lands and were inclined to side with the British. To prevent this, the Americans in 1775 convinced the powerful Iroquois to remain neutral. But by the summer of 1777, American troops were raiding deep into Iroquois territory and Native Americans could sit still no longer. Most of the Native American nations fought with the British because they saw the British as the protectors of their land and they saw the colonists as the encroachers on their land. So it made sense for the American Indians to think that they would be better off if the British won the war. Most of the Iroquois decided to fight for the British, but the Oneida and the Tuscarora chose to join the Americans. The split ended in an alliance that had lasted 300 years and turned out to be disastrous for the once powerful Six Nations. Iroquois warriors fought with the British in brutal raids into central New York and Pennsylvania. The Americans responded in kind, driving the Iroquois from their ancestral lands. When the war was over, the British totally ignored Native American land claims. In the Treaty of Paris, they gave all the land east of the Mississippi to the Americans. Joseph Brandt was left trying to find a place for the Mohawks to live in Canada. The Great Iroquois Confederation was gone forever. 
For African Americans, the American Revolution did not bring as much freedom as it had promised on either side. Thousands of slaves who escaped to the British did win their freedom. Hundreds were returned to their masters or sold to the West Indies. But far more sought a life in Nova Scotia and Florida, and many of these returned to Africa in the 1790s to found a new nation, Sierra Leone. But the ideas unleashed during the American Revolution did change how Americans thought about slavery. But it was an increasingly a discomfort for people that the economy was connected to human suffering in this way. Um, and when they looked at their own desire for freedom, many people began to envision um, freedom for other people as well. The way that transition came about was through the actions of African Americans themselves, who raised the issue openly and publicly, both in print and verbally, about what is this business of all men being created equal? What about us? Where are we included? And we expect, they said, we expect freedom. In 1783, the Massachusetts Superior Court found that the state's constitution did not give sanction to slavery. Over the next 20 years, the other northern states also abolished slavery or passed laws that would set slaves free over time. Only in the Deep South, where slavery remained economically essential, did slave laws become tougher than ever. The war also ended the overseas slave trade. Only South Carolina and Georgia would ever start it again. For many women, the war for independence brought a new sense of self. Applying ideas about human rights to themselves, they began their own long struggle for political rights, educational opportunities, legal rights, and more. The artisans and the farmers, shopkeepers and laborers who fought for independence believed passionately in the ideas of Republican government. They had high hopes of participating in the new nation's political future. But politics often makes strange friendships, and so it was with independence. The poor and powerless had fought for more equality and a chance to participate in a new kind of government. The wealthy had declared independence from England to keep the power and freedom they already enjoyed in America. Now that these two groups had won their independence, what kind of government would they create? Would it be a Republican government controlled by the people? Or would it keep political power in the hands of the wealthy few? How much power should be in the hands of the states? How much would be entrusted to the new central government? What would be the rights of people living in the new territories? All this and more must be decided as a new form of government is hammered out, based not on the divine right of kings, but on historical experience and on reason. Now that the war was over, it was time to build a nation. A way to raise additional revenues to pay for the cost of this exciting new territory in North America. So Parliament passed the Sugar and Currency Acts in 1764, but without the colonists' consent. If a government can tax you, then that government can take away your property, your wealth. So any government that overstepped its boundaries in terms of taxation was attacking your fundamental right to hold property. Did Parliament have the right to pass laws to which the colonies had not consented? When Parliament passed the Stamp Act of 1765, the colonists responded with a resounding no. The stamp. What would bring people to the point of risking everything to try something new? In 1760, the colonists celebrated the arrival of King George III to the throne of England. Like all loyal British subjects, they believed that they lived under the fairest and most balanced system of government ever made by man. Only 16 years later, these same colonists were locked in a deadly struggle with the most powerful military force in the world. What happened in those 16 years? What drove the colonists to the point of revolution?
According to John Adams, the American Revolution began long before the war for independence actually started. The real American Revolution was in the minds of the people and occurred before a drop of blood was shed. So when did it begin? Victory over France in the Seven Years' War left England in charge of an enormous, sprawling empire. Great Britain had a huge debt as a consequence of that Seven Years' War. Uh, so the British Parliament had a real need to find tax was a wide-ranging uh, tax on all manner of economic life in America. No taxation without representation blared newspapers up and down the colonies. A Stamp Act Congress met in New York and sent respectful protests to the king. The British called this a dangerous tendency. But an even more dangerous tendency was stirring up in Boston. On the night of August 14th, a furious mob tore through the house of Stamp Master Andrew Oliver. During the next 12 days, Stamp Act riots took over Boston. Several thousand. These are the times that try men's souls. The crowd called to them, lobsters, bloody backs. We're not afraid of you. I turned to look towards the officer, and I heard the word fire. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. We are a race of beings who have long labored under the abuse of the world. Revolution is a frightening word. It brings up bloody images of power taken by force, of a world turned upside down.